Welcome back to AP Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug and in this video we're going to be learning more about entropy and enthalpy as well and the forces that drive chemical reactions. Now in our last video we left off at this point here where we were actually predicting the sign of delta S which as we found you can do that based upon the states of matter that you have in there and if it's a tie then it comes down to the number of particles. Well this brings us to the second law of thermodynamics. Now the second law of thermodynamics can be stated in a couple ways. The entropy of an isolated system will always increase over time. And we can also state it as every spontaneous process increases the entropy of the universe. This is the way that we often uh, relate the second law of thermodynamics in, in general chemistry, in AP chemistry. So uh, we are generally going to increase entropy. Now notice in the previous video we talked about how normally enthalpy will tend to decrease. That's the, the normal way that the universe works. And so we're saying that also the normal way that the universe works is that entropy will tend to increase. That's normally how it works. Now when we say spontaneous process, you know, there's that word there, spontaneous. What is a spontaneous process? Well, in chemistry, we often call it a thermodynamically favored process. Um, years ago, the word spontaneous and spontaneous process was found quite um, copiously, if that's a word, in AP chemistry and in general chemistry textbooks. Uh, we don't use that quite as much today. We often refer to it as a thermodynamically favored process because sometimes people get that confused with spontaneous combustion and other things. So we say thermodynamically favored process, or I'll just abbreviate that as TFP. So what is that? Well, it's a process that's going to happen at a specific temperature. So, it, so if a process will happen, we, oh, we can call it a TFP. If a process doesn't happen, it's not a TFP. So let's take a look at these two driving forces. Reactions can be driven by basically two forces, okay? Decreasing enthalpy. We said in the last video that if you have an exothermic reaction, well, guess what? The fact that it's exothermic, the enthalpy is going to drive that process. Exothermic reactions tend to be favored in the universe. So negative delta H, it's going to be driven. Or here's the one that we just learned, increasing entropy. So if you have a, a reaction that has uh, a delta S that's positive, if its entropy is increasing, that's favored as well. So if you have a, a reaction that's increasing in entropy, you can point to that reaction and say, entropy is a driving force in that process. And guess what? If both of those are true, if it's an exothermic process, and it's increasing in, in entropy, then you can point to that reaction and say that it has two driving forces, enthalpy and entropy. And if that's the case, then that reaction is going to be thermodynamically favored. It's a TFP at all temperatures. It's a reaction that will always be able to happen at any temperature if both of these things are true. And there are several reactions for which both of those things are true. We'll look at some examples of those here later. Now what if neither of those are true? And there are several reactions for which neither of those are true. Well guess what? If it's endothermic and it has a decreasing entropy, then it is not a TFP. It doesn't have any driving forces to, to drive it to happen. So we'd say that that reaction or that potential reaction would never be thermodynamically favored at any temperature. Now does that mean that it could never take place? Well, if it does, we're going to have to drive it using some other external force, like electricity or something like that, but it's not going to happen on its own. So it's not a TFP at any temperature. So we have those statements. We have those two driving forces. Now, how do we calculate the value for delta S? Because in the last video, we were able to predict the sign for it, if it was going to be positive or negative. But we're going to actually calculate a numerical value for this. Well, we calculate it using this equation. This is an equation that looks kind of familiar to us, that delta S 
is equal to the sum of all the individual entropies of the products minus the sum of all the individual entropies of the reactants. Now, we did this exact same thing for enthalpy in uh, the last lesson, didn't we? In lesson 15, I believe it was. And we just had to use those constants that, that are given to us on a table or in uh, a textbook or something, and we can use these. So let's take a look at this reaction here. Carbon plus water vapor yields carbon monoxide gas plus hydrogen gas. So we're going to calculate the delta S of these from the constants. Now, if you have a textbook or you have a list of these constants, you can follow along. We can take a look at carbon. It has an entropy of 5.7 joules per mole Kelvin. And we have just one mole of that. So we multiply it by one, which of course doesn't change it. And then water vapor, water in its gaseous state, has an entropy of 188.8 joules per mole Kelvin. And of course, there's only one of those. We multiply it by one and we get the same thing. And carbon monoxide gas, if we look on the table there, it's about 197.9 joules per mole Kelvin. And we have one mole of that. So of course, it doesn't change. We have H2, and that is 130.6 joules per mole Kelvin. And there's only one mole of that. So it doesn't change either. So now it's the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. So we have the two uh, products, or I'm sorry, the, we'll start with the reactants here on the left side. We have the reactants over here. We add those together, we get 194.5 as the total there. And then we have these products, we add those together, and those add up to about 328.5. And it's products minus reactants, just like it was for enthalpy. So it's going to be 328.5 minus the 194.5. So when we subtract this, we find that the overall delta S is positive 134 joules per mole Kelvin. So that's how we actually get the numerical value for delta S with these constants. And it's done the same way that we did uh, for enthalpy. So entropy S, entropy, is increasing. So let's think about this reaction here for a minute. Carbon plus water yields carbon monoxide plus hydrogen. So does this reaction happen? If you take a piece of carbon, like you know the carbon that's in your pencil, or a lump of coal, or a diamond, that's carbon also, and you get it wet, or you expose it to steam, does it decompose into carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas? Well, if you take a pencil or a diamond ring or something and put it over a stove that has steam, it doesn't do that, does it? It does not decompose. So you might think that the reaction doesn't happen. Well, according to the delta, a, the delta H and the delta S, it does happen. And this reaction does take place. And we know this because if you look at the delta H, and this is one that we have calculated separately in the past, well, it's endothermic. So uh, if you look at the enthalpy, you'd say, well, endothermic, it should not happen. Enthalpy does not drive that reaction. But what about entropy? Entropy is positive, isn't it? So if this reaction takes place, it takes place because of entropy, because entropy is increasing. Yes, entropy is the one that drives it. Well, guess what? Only It, it has only one driving force. It's entropy. And since this is the case, you know, enthalpy won't, but entropy would, and since they're both positive, the reaction is only favored at high temperatures. Okay, you need to know that. If they're both positive, then high temperatures, that's how it's going to be favored. So if we have relatively low temperatures, like at you know room temperature or pretty close to it, and you take a lump of coal and expose it to steam, it does not undergo this reaction. It doesn't undergo this. But if you jack the temperature up high enough, then yes, it is going to be um, thermodynamically favored. It will be a TFP.
Okay, so we can use the delta H and the delta S values here to kind of figure out, you know, if a reaction is driven, well, at high temperatures or at, at what types of temperatures. Now let's take it let's take a look at this reaction. Here's a reaction that we've looked at before, a net ionic equation. And does this reaction happen? Well, yes, it does. Right? This is one that we've written many times in net ionic equations. And we know that this reaction does happen. You know, silver chloride is insoluble. You are gonna you are gonna make that. But at what conditions? Well, if we look at the delta S we find that entropy is decreasing. In fact, you could tell that just by looking at the equation, right? We have aqueous that turns into solid. You know, that's a, you know, aqueous is pretty high up on the entropy scale and solid's pretty low. That's a decrease in entropy. So, entropy is not going to drive that reaction. If you only look at entropy, you'd say, well, that reaction shouldn't happen. Well, we know the reaction happens. It's got to be driven by the other one enthalpy, right? If you look at the delta H of this, look at that. It is an exothermic reaction. It's negative. So when the reaction happens, it's driven by the enthalpy. And guess what? Since both of these are negative, the reaction is a TFP. It's thermodynamically favored at relatively low temperatures. So you need to know that as well. So, you know, they're both negative, so it's going to be favored at low temperatures. So that means that you know, if you raise the temperature high enough, then I guess all that silver chloride is going to dissolve. And I guess that's kind of confirmed by what we've learned already in solution chemistry, right? At high enough temperatures, you can get almost anything to uh, dissolve, right? So this makes sense. I hope you, that you can see that the thermodynamics is just a part of everything else that we've uh, learned already in this course in general chemistry in AP Chem. So let's review these driving forces here briefly. If you have a case where the reaction is exothermic and entropy is, is increasing, well then it's driven by both of those forces. And it's going to be a TFP at all temperatures. But what if it's the opposite? It's endothermic and it's decreasing entropy. Well that poor reaction is never going to happen spontaneously, is it? It's not a thermodynamically favored process at all. Now, what if you have a case where they're both positive? Well, it's going to be a TFP at very positive temperatures only, very high temperatures, right? So uh, that, that would be a case where it's driven by the entropy, right? Because that's, that's favored here. What about if they're both negative? Well, if they're both negative, then that means that you're it's going to be a TFP at these negative or uh, negative temperatures or lower temperatures only. And we'll talk about how low here later. Uh, and in this case, it, it would be driven by the, the enthalpy. So that's how this works. This is how you can determine at what kinds of temperatures uh, a reaction is going to be thermodynamically favored. But this kind of brings up the question, is there a way to actually quantify this? Is there a way to decide, you know, we said high temperatures, well, how high of a temperature do we need to get it? Or low temperatures, how low of a temperature do we, do we need to get it? Can, can we actually put some numbers to this? Can we determine, you know, how thermodynamically favored something is? And the answer, of course, since this is chemistry, is yes. And there is a, another uh, quantity that we're going to calculate it's called delta G, and that stands for Gibbs free energy. And that's actually a, a numerical value of the thermodyna thermodynamic favorability of a reaction. And that's what we're going to discuss in the next video. So I know I've left you here on a cliffhanger. So I hope you join me again to watch the next video. If you uh, learned uh, all of this all of these things about thermodynamics and understand it, you can pat yourself on the back, give yourself a thumbs up. And if you give me a thumbs up too, I'd sure appreciate it. That way YouTube will get the word out about my channel and all these AP chemistry videos, general chemistry videos. I want you to get an A in the class and an A and a five on the AP chem exam if you're planning on taking that. Uh, join my channel again. I'm Jeremy Krug. I, I teach AP chemistry and I've been doing this for over 20 years and hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together.